and to the women who, despite barriers, proudly succeed and excel in medicine. Our HMS logo um, features Esquilios, as you see, and you're familiar from all our mailings, who is a proud male figure representing the chief in medicine. But also there is the female precedent, historically, as you see here, this is his daughter, Igia, with his filios. And in addition, there were other female daughters of his filios, uh, representing medicine, healing, AD, the healthy glow, panacea, universal remedy, and meditrina, the serpent bear. Today I will speak to you about medical pathetics, who is the namesake of the symposium. This symposium is dedicated to the legacy of Medical Apophagus as the first Hellenic American physician. She was the first to practice medicine in modern times. Medical Apophagus was born in Athens in 1859, was the daughter of Michael Apophagus, also a medical doctor from Athens, Greece, and Martha Hooper Blackler from Mar Marblehead, Massachusetts. She studied in Greek and American schools and graduated from the Harvard Annex, now Rad Radcliffe College, as shown in the picture. Athens in the early 1880s was deeply conservative, and as regards uh, to women, was probably best characterized as intensely mid-Victorian. Athens had not yet been confronted with the problem of higher education for women. It was to Paris that Medical Apothecaries, the first Greek medical woman, had to turn for medical education. She was admitted to medical school in Paris University in October of 1886. There, for eight years, she enjoyed equal rights to men, with privileges in lecture rooms, laboratories, dissecting room, um, hospital wards, and operating room. She returned to Athens in 1884, in 1894, and contributed significantly to the field of medicine serving with humanitarian resolve as a medical doctor and surgeon during the difficult period of Greek wartime history. She also served in the Red Cross, and this is her toolbox of medical supplies that she used during that time. In today's symposium, we're going to discuss the pioneering work medical effects contributed to hygiene and to the treatment of tuberculosis. This lecture is um, I'm presenting um, authored and in translation an, uh, an article written by John Sebast, oral surgeon in, in Greece, that will be published also in the National Herald in Greek, about Maria Glopofax's contribution to public health in the treatment of tuberculosis. In 1897, the unfortunate Greco Turkish War took place, and Maria Glopofax took part as doctor in the Hospital of the Association of Women in Bolos. Her heroism and insistence on treating the injured, even when the Turks entered the city, when everybody was living, was legendary. After the war in 1898, the Association of Women divided into two sections, health and nursing. Karlovakis was president, and she established a clinic for women in, the, in, in, in training of nurses. She worked in public health, especially the care and prevention of tuberculosis. During this time, tuberculosis was a big problem and, and was rapidly spreading among society uh, with threatening um, the health of many and with grave public health consequences. Here is a painting by Cristobal Rojas depicting a lady dying of tuberculosis in squalid condition. In Greece, people not, uh, had a diet low in calories and of nutritional value and therefore were prime um, subjects to be infected and also to propagate the, the disease. But there was no plumbing, they lived in one room huts and shacks, and many families and large crowds um, um, lived together sharing space without ventilation. Even schools looked like slums according to various testimonies, sunless, without air, without hygiene. In this environment, tuberculosis in Greece was rapidly spreading. The task of persuading and educating a population that ignored or avoided the destruction of contaminated materials made the work of the Association of Women and their president, Herobothagis, very difficult. 
It was not until 1908, after many struggles, that the service of the disin disin disinfectation was instituted by the Ministry of the Interior. The effort of the decision of Greek women and personally of Kalumthakis for tuberculosis was the only organized effort from the war in 1897 until 1901, when the first Pan-Hellenic Medical Congress took place. In this conference, Medical Kothakis gave an oral presentation and distributed a booklet in hygiene that she had authored and had you know, in, uh, instructed the population on how to appropriately clean themselves, uh, uh, dispose of contaminated um, materials, and um, allow for the institution of preventative measures and subsequently the erecting of sanatoriums. She pioneered the teaching and implementation of hygiene rules in order to stop the vicious spread of tuberculosis. And she even um, put in place the first one, of, one clinical trial with the treatment of sulfide bicarbonate that was a process of Dr. Coromilas with endotracheal installation of this, of this medicine that had shown some promising results in Paris Hospital. Um, she offered uh, wards of the association's hospital to do a controlled trial of two years testing this method. This, this was for antibiotics and this was one approach to try to combat the disease. She was commended for her efforts and was appointed professor of hygiene in the Arsai Home School and um, wrote uh, an edition of manual for the classrooms in health information for schools in 1912, as well as a monthly magazine called Igia, with the main subject of hygiene as her topic. And in a society that had an absolute necessity for them, her, ground was, her work was groundbreaking and basically did not have the support of the official state or of any private um, charities. The research for tuberculosis and the enforcement of rules of hygiene was a personal challenge she tried to win, and we can say that largely thanks to her patience and hard work, she succeeded. The reward was to feel that she helped in instituting the foundations of public hygiene, which gradually acquired the protection and financial assistance of the state. Here are some pictures of Thorophytes uh, with a British nurse, because in Greece at the time there were no trained nurses during the war of 1897, as well as a letter of thanks for her contributions by, by the Queen Olga, Her Majesty, in 1898 for her work with the Association of Greek Women. Medica Kothakis will be remembered with the legacy that she um, left. A uh, contemporary uh, said of Mary that she is a saint. Not only does she take money from the poor, but she pays for their medication from her pocket. So now jumping to more modern times, we should note that in 2009, half of newly minted physicians will be female. However, in 1969, that figure was fewer than one in 10. This makes this knowledge and having in mind the very, very recent history of women entering uh, modern medicine in the United States makes the, the contributions and the legacy of our awardee today, Dr. Arthur Mismopoulos, even more inspiring. So without further, further ado, I want to welcome our president, Dr. Mazitis, who will uh, give his greeting as well as introduce our awardee, Dr. Smokulos. Thank you. guests and distinguished guests, colleagues, thank you for being here this evening and uh, thank you Dr. Nguyenis for a very inspired introduction. Uh, this is actually a conference which uh, I think is very important. It's very important because it emphasizes the work of uh, a distinguished female scientist, as Dr. Nguyenis was saying. It also reminds us that actually us Bjors did not have six daughters. He definitely had three more that you're meeting this evening. And uh, he has many others who are present here and others who are in the making. So this is in our tradition. And uh, it also reminds us, this example of Dr. Mary Kalopathakis, what we see here, you see, this is the power of the white blouse that we have the honor of wearing. And uh, particularly in times of trial, such as now, which is a time equally troubling to that that uh, Dr. Mary Kolopathakis had to confront in the 1890s, a time of trauma, a time of uh, tremendous upset for Greece 
those years, those critical years, 1897 through the 1920s, when we also had to bring in thousands, millions of uh, people from uh, the destroyed Greek lands of Asia Minor. And uh, this was something which was commonplace. This is something that we would never, never like to encounter. But unfortunately, as we know, even at the present time, as we hear from our colleagues in Greece, we have situations like this, unfortunately. And it remains to us, uh, with uh, exemplary physicians, such as those who will speak to us this evening, to try to address this issue. And we will address this issue, and I will introduce to you a distinguished uh, representative of our profession who will speak to this. I would also like to inform you that we're working right now with the Hellenic, uh, the Athens Society of Medicine, I should say the AMA of Athens, to enter into a fraternal relationship so that we can proceed with our work of assistance to the colleagues in Greece who need medications, who need support and guidance, particularly in the frontier provinces where we're unfortunately encountering very difficult circumstances. So, uh, yes, uh, we do have a privilege of wearing the white blouse, but uh, we do so with the understanding that we are in the Hippocratic and Asclepian tradition. And uh, I'd also like to mention, as I introduce our distinguished honoree for this year, something that Margaret Thatcher, who, as you know, passed away and had uh, a tremendous uh, funeral exit uh, in London a few days ago. And, uh, Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, uh, among other things, had this very interesting quote where she reminded us that uh, if you want something said, ask a man. If you want something done, ask a woman. <laughs> and this is very true, and uh, time and time again I'm reminded of that. So, with uh, a lot of uh, respect, uh, I would like to introduce to you this evening our honorary Miracle of the Haggis Award for 2013, Dr. Artemis Simopoulos, who is uh, a very distinguished scientist and physician. She is founder and president of the Center of Genetics, Nutrition and Health, which is a not-for-profit educational organization in Washington, D.C., uh, a graduate of Barnard College, Columbia University, with special ties to New York City, with a major in chemistry, a graduate of Boston University School of Medicine, so she's uh, worked on the entire Eastern Seaboard, and a physician and a fellow endocrinologist with research at the National Institutes of Health on the nutritional aspects of genetic and endocrine disorders. In addition to this, of course, she's held very many important positions, such as being Executive Secretary of the Division of Medical Sciences at the National Research Council at the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C. from 1972 to 1977, She's also chaired the Nutrition Coordinating Committee of the NIH from 1978 through 1986. She was a consultant on nutrition and health to uh, the White House uh, in various capacities. She served on many committees, and I don't want to belabor the point here. Uh, and at the present time, of course, untiringly, she is also working in Greece, as she will probably have the opportunity to tell us, with special committees there in order to uh, create, I think, a foundation <laughs> for the university field and for nutrition and the nutrition sciences in Greece. So we're looking to help our compatriots in a variety of ways, both as physicians, as academics, as teachers, and this is, uh, so it's with great pleasure I'd like to invite Dr. Athenis Mopoulos to join us here and uh, to give us her presentation. Uh, we also have our award here, which we'll present. I'm indeed delighted to be here, and I uh, feel deeply honored to have been selected for the award. That indeed. Um, honors women in medicine 
for medicine, for women, for child health, and for Greece. I also want to thank the awards committee and the president, Dr. Dometis, of the Hellenic Medical Society, and for the kind introduction to me. I thought that I would like for you to think back in the 5th century BC and pretend they were all in the island of Kos, at which time medicine flourished in terms of science because the scientists in the area of the physical philosopher and mathematicians had actually moved forward and so medicine became more scientific, actually became scientific, I would say, and moved away from being under the control of the high priest as it the case and remained so in Egypt. The Hippocratic physicians were vitally interested not only taking care of the patients, but in prevention. But because there were the world prevention, Prolipsis has negative connotation in Greek. They develop the concept of positive health, which they define as being or acquiring knowledge of man's primary constitution, what today we call genetics, and of the powers of various foods, both those natural to them and those resulting from human skills, today's processed food. So natural is a word that has been used in food for a long, long time. But eating alone is not enough for health. There must also be exercise of which the effects must likewise be known. The combination of these two things makes regimen when proper attention is given to the season of the year, the changes of the winds, the age of the individual, and the situation of his home. If there is any deficiency in food or exercise, the body will fall sick. Because today's Western societies are definitely deficient in exercise, because we tend to be sedentary. And in terms of the essential fatty acids, which are, I would say, the most important um, part of the Mediterranean diet, um, we are in, in a situation where we definitely need to begin to move forward thinking in terms of how our genetic makeup interacts with the environment in which we live and how that influences the phenotype throughout development. So the Hippocratic physicians were very first to put any emphasis on genetics, food, exercise, as well as the whole environment. We can just translate today by using the techniques of molecular biology and genetics into this triangle, looking at the genotype and how the environment, what I'm going to cover tonight is going to be mostly nutrition, influence the phenotype throughout the bed. And this is a very dynamic process. So when we look at the environment, in this case nutrition, we know that major changes are taking place in the food supply, uh, particularly when we look back all the way to the period of the herder gatherers, and then the agricultural revolution, and then the industrial revolution. And we can see very clearly that <coughs> human beings evolved on a diet that was much lower in uh, saturated fat and definitely much lower in the omega-6 fatty acids and in fact today what we have is we have an enormous increase in the essential fatty acid, the omega-6 with a um, decrease in omega-3 so the balance that existed between the omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids during evolution 
changed enormously in the past 100 years. At the same time, there have been major changes in terms of the antioxidants, particularly vitamin C and vitamin E. So that as a result today, our genes are faced with a food supply that is very different from the one that they were programmed to respond during the long phase of evolution. The reason I'm going to give you a short overview of the omega-3 and omega-6 essential fatty acids is because it is one of the most important components of the Mediterranean diet, which I am going to refer to from now on, the traditional diet of Greece, as exemplified by the diet uh, of Crete. So the omega-6 and omega-3 essential fatty acids are depicted here at the 18 carbon level. And they are the parent fatty acids, linoleic acid, and linolenic or alpha linolenic acid. These two families are physiologically and metabolically distinct. They have opposing properties, and it is very important that they are in balance for normal metabolism. Remember, during evolution, the amounts were equal, they were in balance. What happens today is that the amount of omega-6 fatty acid, which is found in large amounts, in vegetable oil such as corn oil, safflower, sunflower, cotton seed oil. And the alpha linolenic acid series, the omega 3s, is found only in oils such as canola oil, in all green leafy vegetables, and uh, in the Far East, in seeds like perilla, uh, in South America, in seeds like chia, and uh, in Northern uh, Europe. Of course, it's rapeseed, which that was their major source of oil. And in various parts of, of the world, linseed uh, oil. But today, the food supply has extremely high amounts of omega-6. For example, the amount of linoleic acid uh, has a ratio anywhere from 50 to 1, uh, you know, linoleic to alpha linolenic, and in some cases, 100 to 1. This extreme amount of omega-6 fatty acid interferes with the proper metabolism of linoleic acid. Now, although uh, under complete natural conditions when there is a balance, this pathway, the omega-3 pathway, is the more rapid. Under current conditions with high amounts of omega-6, um, you have this pathway more or less becoming the dominant uh, pathway. And they, because they use the same desaturases and elongases, any changes or any genetic variance at the level of delta-6 desaturation or types 2 or delta-5 desaturation or types 1 interferes and influences the, the production of arachidonic acid, the omega-6, and the production of EPA, the omega-3s, which are the parent fatty acids for the production of eposanoids, hormone-like substances that have those that come from the arachidonic acid are pro-probotic and pro-inflammatory for those from EPA and um, uh, DHA, another omega fatty acid, uh, are less inflammatory and uh, less uh, probotic. <coughs> so for there is an imbalance at this level, you have an imbalance at the level of 20, and then you have an imbalance of the production of eposanoids and either uh, cytokines. Uh, what I would like to emphasize is that uh, um, in, in, um, the desaturates delta-6 and delta-5 are um, definitely um, uh, they have genetic variants and some of the genetic variants increase the pathway going from 18 to down to arachidonic acid. So if you, ha if you happen to inherit a polymorphism that leads to the increased production of arachidonic acid, you are much more at risk for uh, obesity, you are much more at risk for cardiovascular disease um, and, um, and diabetes. Um, so 
when you have the high amount that you have today in the food supply, plus the genetic barrier with high amounts of paracetonic acid, then there's definitely an, an increase in, in chronic diseases. About 30% of the population has the so-called rapid uh, metabolic pathway from 82 to 83. Uh, the other thing I want to tell you is um, when, when we had high amounts of trans fatty acids in the food supply, it blocked the metabolism of these two fatty acids, uh, which again interfered with normal uh, metabolism. Now, this just depicts what I said, is that if you have an imbalance, you have too much omega-6 and not too much omega-3s, uh, then you end up in a situation where you get all these um, eicosanoids produced from arachidonic acid and the less active eicosanoids produced from EPA and DHA, and those from arachidonic acid are pro-inflammatory, and they lead to cytokine production, those from omega-3s, EPA and DHA are less inflammatory and lead to less cytokine production. And uh, the um, arachidonic acid increases nuclear factor kappa B, which then leads uh, to another pro-inflammatory type of uh, situation, which is associated with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, cardiovascular disease, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, um, Alzheimer's disease, etc. So during the evolution, the amount of um, linoleic, the ratio was about 0.7, for today on the average is 18. But there are situations where it's as high as 50 to 1 or 100 to 1. And the longer chain fatty acids, where during the Paleolithic period, 1.7, today this is again high. So when you put together the 18 carbonatums and the 20, you end up with a ratio which is average for the US and most Western countries at 16.74 instead of being just about one. So we have a number of people who have been interested in that and have been doing studies over the period of years. And the diet that actually is closer to the diet of evolution, the Paleolithic diet, was the diet of Greece prior to 1960. And uh, the one that comes right after that actually is Japan. As you can see, current United States is high, Western Europe, Indian, urban is very high because they <coughs> increase the, the amount of um, sunflower oil in their food supply and that led to an extreme amounts of omega-6 fatty acids, and before they had a tendency genetically to have central obesity and diabetes. Today, the people in India, they have the highest prevalence of diabetes. So I wanted to give you this background because, as I said, the balance of essential fatty acids is an important component of the Mediterranean diet, and I'll tell you how we understood that and how it came about. So this is the map that all of us are familiar with, and this is Greece. I always think of it as being much bigger, only when I see at this map, I realize <laughs> country. So, in, uh, in the 1930s, people had observed that the people who lived in the island of Crete, they had the lowest rate of heart disease, the lowest rate of cancer, and lived the longest. So they wanted to do a study to be able to evaluate what this genetic, was it environmental, was it nutrition specific. And um, just as they were ready to pull the study together, the war broke in, uh, in Europe in 1937, 39, and then in Greece in 1940. And so this was put aside. But it was very obvious, and this was published back, and I'm sure you all had a chance to read it, in 1948 that um, although Greece and the Mediterranean countries are usually considered to be areas of medium high death rates, 14,000 uh, inhabitants, death rates on the island of Crete have been below this level continuously since before <coughs> 1930. No other area 
in the Mediterranean basin has had as low a death rate as Spit, according to data compiled by the United Nations in their demographic yearbook for 1948. So it was 11.3 to 13.7 before World War II and about 10.6 in 1946-1948. Cancer and heart disease caused almost three times as many deaths proportionally in the United States as in Crete. The diet of Crete represents the traditional diet of this before the 1960s. So they felt they have to get going and establish the seven country study that consisted of Greece, the populations of Crete and Corfu, Yugoslavia, the, the then Yugoslavia, <coughs> the Adriatic Sea, Croatia, etc., Italy, Holland, Finland, United States, and Japan. This is supposed to be US, believe it or not. And as you can see, there was tremendous difference between the total fat intake of the population of Crete versus that of Japan. Then, when they look specifically uh, how much olive oil is actually eaten by the populations in uh, the Mediterranean countries, as well as the uh, US, you can see that Greeks had more olive oil in their diet than any of the others. For the others, already, they were growing sunflower, and part of their oil was sunflower, which is high in omega-6. The Greeks at that time did not have any sunflower oil in their diet. It was mostly olive oil. I specifically did a series of studies because I was interested uh, to see what was the, the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 in the various olive oils, and also the squalene content, because squalene is a very potent anti oxidant and also anti-carcinogenic agent. And based on the amount of squalene, and I would say the ratio, I found out that the olive oil from Andrusa, Messinia, which is just a small village outside of Kalamata, and the Aurelio of Crick were actually uh, the two best olive oils if you were to look in terms of the fatty acid content as the antioxidant content. And today we know there are polyphenols and a lot of other substances in olive oil that account for it is anti-inflammatory properties and all of them actually block arachidonic acid uh, metabolism. As you can see, the Spanish um, olive oils and the Italian have a high ratio, a lot of um, omega-6, maybe they diluted with something else. This is an extremely high ratio for, for olive oil. And I have encourage the Olive Oil Council to specifically evaluate and measure uh, the types of fatty acids and antioxidants and more or less give a value to olive oil based on that rather than using, you know, if, uh, the oxidant content of olive oil, which is, is, is not really very meaningful. So this is the olive oil from our farm, which is south of Kalamata in Mali. And um, it's delicious olive oil. So here it is. The linoleic acid is less than 6%. <laughs> Remember, in the Italian <coughs> olive oil, we have 15%. So I would like now to tell you specifically what happened with the seven country study. So the seven country study, uh, to their surprise, they found out in terms of the life expectancy, disease rate, in the United States and Greece were enormously different. At the age of 45, the life expectancy in the US was 27, where in Greece it was 31. And for the women, it was even higher. Coronary heart disease, rate it was 189 in the US, 33 in Crete. Cerebrovascular disease, as you can see, much higher in the male than the female. Very low in, in Greece, in fact, for 
breast cancer, much lower. Stomach cancer. Now, the stomach cancer in Greece was much higher at that time because they did not have refrigeration and they preserved food with salt. And high salt in food leads to gastric cancer. We, we know that. Colorectal cancer was very low, and total cancers were very low. And although they have increased, they still continue to be much lower than the rest of Europe. So they, they went back and evaluated them, the dietary characteristics. And you can see there was not that much difference in the percent of energy from saturated. <coughs> and Keyes, who was the principal investigator of the seven country study, was absolutely certain that is the saturated fat that caused heart disease. He never looked at the essential fatty acids, and he himself did not believe in it. The saturated fat energy in the United States at that time was very high. In Greece, it was 8%, and most studies show that 8% is really the best amount of saturated fat that you should have. And then, of course, the vegetables were very high, and the fruits, and legumes. Breads and cereals were much higher, but the type of bread, it was mostly sourdough bread, which is very important. It was quite different. Um, and I get very concerned when I hear people talking about Mediterranean diets without looking specifically at um, the composition of the food and how it is cooked, because the Italians eat pasta every day, and pasta is water and white flour, which is just simple carbohydrates. For the Greeks, it ate them sourdough bread. Most of it was whole grain. And sourdough bread cuts your appetite because it stays in the, in the um, stomach much longer. So they ate more potatoes, but they didn't eat like mashed potatoes. They cook them with olive oil along with other vegetables, and that makes an enormous difference. Much less sweet, more fish, less eggs, and of course a little bit more wine than what was then uh, being drunk in the United States. So these were the data, and on the basis of this, they drew conclusions that it is very important to cut down the saturated fat in the diet and increase the polyunsaturated. Now remember, the people in Crete never had any polyunsaturates. It was olive oil. Olive oil was very expensive in the United States. And I remember, when I came to Barnard, I would see advertisement that said that olive oil is heavy, and they were advertising corn oil as light. And people used to think that olive oil has more calories than corn oil. I mean, a marketing situation of totally misguiding the population. So this is uh, from the National Geographic, volume in 1969. I was cleaning up some old National Geographic and I found this one. So they started, Keys and Company, they started this enormous campaign to polyunsaturate the whole United States. And this was, I would say, an experiment that involved the whole population never been done before in the history of medicine or in the history of nutrition. Then they found out that Americans really don't like to put corn oil on, uh, which was the most popular at that time, um, on their bread. Um, so they had to have something that they could spread. So they remembered that the French had used margarine in, uh, in 1914, but the French didn't like it. So they were ahead and stopped it. The Americans bought the company and the technology, and they improved it. They bleached it so it was no longer yellow, and they made it much softer. And it looked just like butter. In fact, I remember going to a meeting where they were advertising the new margarine, and you cannot tell it's not butter. So you ended up then with a food supply where the foods were cooked and fried in omega-6, mostly corn oil and then sunflower oil, and uh, margarine was spread on wet, and margarine was full of trans fatty acids. They never studied to see what is the effect of margarine. They only studied the effect of corn oil and sunflower on cholesterol levels, 
which of course lower it, because any time you lower or saturate fat, you lower the cholesterol. But they never did the studies to show that if you lower the cholesterol, you lower cardiovascular disease. All this campaign was based on the fact that sunflower and corn oil lower the risk, <coughs> lower the uh, cholesterol level. So let me show you what the food supply looked like then. Uh, remember that everything that is blue, and this is the majority, is um, actually linoleic acid. Now, canola is a pretty good oil because it has 10% alpha-linolenic acid, which gives you a ratio of 2 to 1. But what people used, and the cheapest, were the sunflower, safflower, corn oil, soybean oil. So you can see, I don't even have to calculate the ratio, you can see exactly how much. Uh, I mean, the country really swam in, in corn oil. Now, I was quite interested and went back because there were all these studies coming out on Mediterranean diets and sports without really looking at actual foods very much, and never mind the food composition. So I asked Dr. Kafatos, who was in Crete at the time, and so he prepared this, um, actually a paper, out of which I took the table, which is one of the best sources of information, telling you exactly what they ate over a week's time uh, at that time in Crete, and that was in the early 1960s, not now. So you can see, they had fruit for snacks mid-morning, in mid-afternoon, walnuts, figs, halvash, tell you that figs, the seeds are full of alpha-linolenic acid, omega-3s, walnuts have omega-3s. And then, if you look, I, I just put down the sources of protein, so they had snails. Now, remember that uh, snails are allowed to be eaten during fast, because it's not meat and it's not fish, some parts in between. So the, the people in Crete and the Greeks at that time, they still fasted. For 120 days, they didn't have any meat, and they had very little dairy, but they had <coughs> a lot of um, chickpeas, herring, and um, uh, sardines were the most common sources of protein <coughs> and omega-3 fatty acids in that diet. And chicken, okra, rabbit, <coughs> animals in the wild, animals in the wild that graze, they have omega-3 fatty acids <coughs> because grass has alpha linolenic acid and in the body becomes even EPA and DHA. So they had then a diet that was, <coughs> gave them more or less a composition that is consistent uh, with evolution. Broad beans, lentils, artichokes, or they boiled lentils with oil. So it was, a it was a diet that had enormous variety, a lot of vegetables, a lot of fruit, olive oil, no trans fatty acids, no omega-6 fatty acids, not huge amounts of saturated fats. Now, this is not a current pattern, and this is not what people in the paper describe as Mediterranean diet. By the way, the reason I don't like the term is because Mediterranean is a geographic term. People in Southern Europe have very different religious cultures from Northern Europe. And, and so it's not really a term to use but I think for marketing is something that helps them. So we we'll looked up to see what are the differences in the Greek um, uh, dietary intake today if you were to compare what it was like in 1962 to 1997. And you can see what happened. And, and that was the time when Greeks were getting a lot of things from, from Europe, uh, both products and money. But as you can see, while the amount of um, meat increased, so did the fish, and so did the vegetables. So they ate more of everything. They did not change their diet. And then if you look in terms of the types of meat, what happened is with time, <coughs> they ate more mutton and, and pork, and then they began to have beef and other meats. But overall, there was an increase in poultry and pork and mutton. And then, in terms of um, 
the various types of fish and marines. Uh, you know, they, they ate mussels and, of course, cephalopods, crustaceans. But they also continued to have their traditional fish. They ate more, but they didn't really change. And then when you compare the amount or that period between the vegetable products and animal products, the vegetables increase parallel to the increase in, in the animal. Um, so then we go to the oils. When did the Greeks begin to change the oil? So you look back in 1962, where the seven country study well, actually took all the histories and began to follow the population. And you had very little cotton seed oil, a, a tiny bit of sunflower, and then it began to increase. So that by 1997, you had a lot of sunflower, but still, the olive oil remained the determining thing. So we, I began to think, what are the other components that increase the amount of omega-3 fatty acids? so that the diet of pig is really consistent with the diet of evolution. And it's the diet that human beings were meant to eat. So we'll start by looking at wild plants, because if Greeks eat wild plants in the form of corda when they are cooked, but also um, in terms of salads, one of the plants that they use, they eat frequently, is called purslane or glistrida or agrafla in Greek. And you can see when you look at it, it's actually a very subtle, primitive type of plant that grows everywhere. It has a long history. And Hippocrates used it for sore throats, ear rapes, and heart failure. So I said, it has to have omega-3 because all the properties. So we went ahead and did a series of studies with first lane and compared it to spinach, butterscotch, but a crunch lettuce, red leaf, and, and mustard. And as you can see, the first lane had the highest amount of total fatty acids. And definitely much more omega-3 fatty acids than spinach or lettuce or red lettuce or mustard. And so we said that it has a high amount of omega-3 fatty acids. It has to have a lot of antioxidants because it has to protect itself uh, from having the oxidation of alpha-linolenic acid. So we did very extensive studies, and we ended up finding out that the 100 grams of first lane, which is one serving, has 30 to 40 milligrams of alpha-linolenic acid, 12 milligrams of vitamin E, 27 of ascorbic acid, and 15 milligrams of glutathione. And there were only, out of 100 plants that we studied in, in the United States, because the, the National Cancer Institute was very much interested in the content of glutathione, since glutathione is a very potent anti-cancer agent, only asparagus and avocado have as much um, glutathione as um, the, the first leg. And so we continue to do all kinds of studies, and to our surprise, we found out that first lay has the highest amount of melatonin. Melatonin is not produced only by the pineal body. Melatonin is found in plants, and it's a very important antioxidant. So we then begin a series of studies, I'm going to go through quickly on that, looking at uh, the egg from chickens who fetch their own food, not chickens fed to eggs. And, um, as you can see here, uh, we compare the Greek egg with the supermarket egg. And I want you to just focus right here at the very end. The ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 in the Greek egg is 1. It's balanced, where in the supermarket egg has a ratio of close 20 to 1. When we do studies with these eggs, those who are prone to increase their cholesterol um, by eating um, eggs, they don't get a rise in the, in the cholesterol when they eat the Greek egg. They do so with the supermarket egg. Then we continue to study the diet of the Greek people by looking at the composition of omega-3 fatty acids 
in male, and if we compare it to the uh, male, two percent male, cheddar, American, Swiss, to the Greek mezifera and Greek feta. And as you can see, because the cattle in Greece at that time um, ate um, uh, um, grapes rather than being fed grapes, they had longer chain fatty acids in the cheese. And both it was a pentanoic acid, all of them, where there was nothing in the daily products in, in, the, in the US diet. And then the same with the snails. The snails in, in Crete, for example, and uh, other parts of Greece, this is from near Sparta, the Peloponnese, they had much higher amounts of uh, omega 3 fatty acids, for example, here, much higher than the French. And today, Greece actually produces and uh, exports snails to Italy and France. Um, it's very important to point out that the type of fish they ate in Greece, it was fish in the wild. It was not the fish that is cultured that most of us eat here in the US today. Cultured fish has much less omega-6. If you look at the ratio the other way, omega-3 to omega-6, the wild salmon has a lot more omega-3s than the cultured one. It also has much less saturated fat. Uh, than the culture of one. So it's very important to have a pretty good idea as to what is the composition of the diet in terms of the various fatty acids, as well as in terms of the antioxidants, because those two types of categories are very important in terms of health. Now, years later, I found out that during the seven country study, they had the data on omega-6 and omega-3 in the cholesterol esters in the people from Crete as well as Lutheran. Remember, Holland was one of the seven countries studied. They were all significant. And the people in Crete had three times as much omega-3 fatty acids in, in their blood as the people in, in Holland. <coughs> so in traditional diets, the omega-3 fatty acids are found throughout the food chain. Eggs have a ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 of 1. Pasta made with eggs and milk, like kilopeters, <coughs> that is rich in omega-3 fatty acids, is enriched in omega-3s. Or pasta made with water and flour or regular milk is not enriched in, in omega-3s. So th this is an entirely different picture that you get when you do this type of studies. And the need to have the omega-3 fatty acids throughout the food supply. So we published this data in the New England um, Journal of Medicine. And Renault, at that time in France, had done very extensive studies. And he was working with the Rogeril in Lyon. And this is a summary of the Lyon heart study. So they used the data we had. And they took um, 594 patients who had one episode of uh, heart attack, divided into two groups. The experimental group is in orange and the control group is in yellow, and the control was the American Heart Association diet, and the, uh, and the experimental group was the diet of Crete based on our data. And you can see that within four to six months, they began to show differences. In terms of all causes of death, the control group had 20 versus eight of the experimental. In terms of cardiovascular death, 16 versus three for the control. Sudden death, zero. And this is very important. You don't want a sudden death. <laughs> so there's nothing you can do. You cannot get to the hospital for that. They had one extra cardiovascular death, which was accidental. Non-fatal MI, 19 versus five. So the yellow is the diet of creep. Remember that. The orange is the American Heart Association diet. The total major primary endpoints was 33 versus 80, 0.27, which really showed a decrease in death rate of 70%. Now, this is a very important study, and they continued it later on, uh, and they have the data now on cancer, and they found out that with time, there is definitely a decrease rate in, uh, in cancer. Now, when we do this type of studies, 
is um, with um, omega-3 supplements as they are doing right now. It's very important to know the background diet. It's very important to know how much omega-6 fatty acids are in the diet. Because if you just add the omega-3s, that's not enough. You're going to find different results and conflicting results if you don't really control the background diet. So this is a study that was done in Italy. And um, the Italian diet is, of course, a diet that um, has olive oil, but it does have omega-6 in small amounts, not as much as you would find in Western Europe, for example, England, Scandinavia, or the United States. So what they did is they did a study with 11,000 patients, and um, they, this, they already had one episode of heart disease. They kept them on their medicines, but one group received EPA and DHA close to a gram. The second group received vitamin E. The third group received both, and the third group received none. And they followed them, and within four to five months, they were able to show changes, and you can see the probability was much higher to have a lower mortality for um, the omega-3s, the same with sudden death, the same with coronary heart disease, and the same with cardiovascular mortality. And years later, uh, others did similar studies, but those that were done, I think, in small numbers, particularly in the US, and they didn't control the background diet, they really did not find the same results. That's why many of the meta-analysis studies are very confusing and conflicting, because they have not had one adequate numbers, and two, they didn't um, take into account how much omega-6 and what was the ratio. So they concluded that the early effect of low dose, 850 milligrams per day of omega-3, on total mortality and sudden death supports the hypothesis of an anti-arrhythmic effect of omega-3 fatty acids. Such a result is consistent with the wealth of evidence coming from laboratory experiments on isolated myocytes, animal models, epidemiological, and clinical studies. And then, I'm sure most of you have seen this cover of Lancet five years ago. Supplementation with omega-3 fatty acids should join the short list of evidence-based life prolonging therapies for, for heart failure. So I want to take a few minutes to go over the prevalence of metabolic, metabolic syndrome, both in terms of the Mediterranean diets, traditional diet of, uh, of these, and also in terms of studies where they have just given omega-3 fatty acids. So this the metabolic syndrome, of course, is very prevalent in the US and more so in some ethnic groups such as Hispanics. And just to remind everybody, abdomen is characterized by abdominal obesity, waste of confidence, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and fasting hyperglycemia. And I'm summarizing here for you, dietary intake of omega-3 fatty acids have insulin sensitivity actions in adipose tissue and liver, and improve insulin sensitivity. Genes involved in insulin sensitivity, such as PIPARA, glucose transporters, and insulin receptor signaling, are upregulated by omega-3 fatty acids. Moreover, omega-3 fatty acids increase adiponectin, an anti-inflammatory and insulin sensitized adipokine, and induce adenosine monophosphate protein kinase phosphorylation, a fuel sensing enzyme, and a gatekeeper of the energy balance. And there are many studies that have been carried out um, <coughs> focusing on the ratio in terms of chronic diseases. And the next two slides summarize that. In the secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease, a ratio of four to one was associated with a 70% increase in total mortality. And this is the study that I mentioned to you, the Leon Heart study. And then a ratio of two to five to one reduced rectal cell proliferation in patients with colorectal cancer, whereas a ratio of four to one with the same amount of omega-3 pupa had no effect, because you need to really lower the omega-6. The lower omega-6 to omega-3 ratio in women with breast cancer was associated with decreased risk. And um, in terms of inflammation and rheumatoid arthritis, 
the results are very similar. Uh, the omega-3 fatty acids are very important in development. That we're doing today, they're given supplements. And there are many studies that clearly show that DHA is essential for um, brain maturation and visual function. And I want to show you this slide because this is a summary of 25-year coronary heart disease mortality in the seven countries studied. So, uh, coronary heart disease mortality rates versus serum cholesterol. So here you are, at the same cholesterol level, the mortality varies, whether you are in Northern Europe, or whether you are in Japan, in Crete, which really points to the fact that cholesterol is not the primary factor for coronary heart disease. Secondly, that the studies uh, th that show similarities between the diet of Japan and the diet of Crete, and they're all characterized by high amounts of omega-3 fatty acids and antioxidants. And um, a number of people then began to focus on the ratio. And there are a number of studies that are going to find the cover. This is just a French, uh, so this is a Swedish study where they were able to change the oils. If you don't use vegetable oils, and you increase the amount of fish to two or three times a week, and have olive oil or canola and olive oil, you actually bring about changes um, by, for example, in this case, they reduce the number of platelets and leukocytes and vascular endothelial growth factor. You bring down all the risk factors that lead to cardiovascular disease. And this was done strictly uh, by um, following the, the diet of Crete or a Mediterranean omega-3, omega-6 balanced diet. And this is a, that's where Mediterranean inspired. And um, another study was done in France where they did very extensive studies because they looked at adiponectin levels, fatty acid oxidation, they looked at hypotines and everything. And they were able by changing the oils to go from a ratio linoleic to alpha linoleic of 32.2 down to very much of that of the, the diet of Crete. So that when we talk about a Mediterranean diet, in essence, the only diet that has been studied extensively has been the, the diet of Crete. And this diet is characterized by balance the omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids lower amounts of saturated fat, plenty of antioxidants from vegetables and, uh, and fruit, definitely nuts, and um, we should not forget the importance of um, lentils and chickpeas and beans. This has been around for thousands of years, and people have always ate legumes. It's only, I think, in Western cultures where they drop them. But now, you, if you go to any good French restaurant, instead of mashed potatoes, they will serve you um, either chickpeas puree or lentils puree or any other uh, legume that is um, puree. So that what I want to leave you with, with this picture, which is the Mediterranean food diet. I use the term Mediterranean here because the editor insisted I had a Greek column food diet. And he said, okay, you can leave it on the side, but the title has to say the Mediterranean food diet. So I had to, if I wanted a paper published, I had to go along. And you can see, this is a, really a summary of what the people in Greece ate, or what the people ate in Greece prior to 1960. And, uh, we should never forget, of course, that genetics and physical activity are part of the diet. And um, the need to, to balance the essential fatty acids through diet is very easy to do by changing the oils, cut down on the meat, and then increase the fish. And um, just to show you how far ahead the Greeks were a long time ago in the 6th and century BC, you know, they cooked all their meat and all their fish only with vegetables. 
And there are data that they, they, that they show um, how much vegetables and fish they ate and how, and how old were when they died. And so the men apparently ate more fish. And the men who ate more fish, they lived longer. And, and this was actually at um, an exhibit from the museum in Athens in 1999. It's, it's a beautiful book. And it really emphasizes Greek culture, life, and, and thought. So I thought I would just um, stop here, leave you with this picture. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak about the